in the first place are records concerning uh, the Greek doctrines are frightfully incomplete. We have no full understanding of their extremely complex system. Um, a parallel to this, or parallels to this, will be found in the early Aryan Indic and also in the Egyptian. We know, for instance, that most of the deities of the Vedas have not been clearly defined. It is true that we have a central stem of theological structure, like a tree, upon which the principal <coughs> gods and their shaktis and their aspects have been noted. But they are surrounded by an infinite group of deities and demigods and godlings that uh, even the native philosopher knows very little about. They have come down from most remote times. And their meanings, unless clearly indicated by their name structures, are most difficult to determine. Even worse is our situation with the Egyptian. Lacking an adequate literature, and depending almost entirely upon the Greco-Roman period, in which the ancient religion had already fallen into decline. The majority of Egyptian deities are not understandable. We know that they had meaning, and probably very important meaning, but the grand scheme or pattern by which they could be fitted together is as yet lacking. And to a large measure, this is true of the Greek. We have explained to you before that in our Greek system we also have a series of interrelated secondary systems. Greek mythology is not from one source, nor does it express the unfolding conviction of one culture group. It is a commixture, and we know definitely that the Greeks borrowed from the Egyptians at an early date. We know also that they had some knowledge of the East Indian divinities, and were affected by the Chaldean and Persian theologies. Thus, it is questionable if all of this structure was understandable even to the average Greek who was informed in such matters. Uh, the, the mysteries uh, celebrated the great state institutions of religion may have helped, but could not and did not apparently uh, completely unfold the system. Perhaps it was done on purpose. Perhaps a large part of this labor was left uh, to the inquiry of the truth seeker, who was thereby stirred and stimulated, as in strange hieroglyphical symbols, to seek a meaning, or to draw from his own consciousness uh, the solution to the riddle. In any event, we are at a disadvantage. And this disadvantage has been made worse by the general neglect of the field and by the powerful antagonism against it in the early rise of the church. Every effort was made uh, to destroy uh, the old monuments and records and uh, such as survived have been long and traditionally associated with false interpretations which are difficult to overcome after so long a period. In the closing lecture of this series, uh, we will go into the Neoplatonic restoration of the mysteries as far as the first four centuries of the Christian era were able to cope with the subject. We gain help from Plato and from other writers, but they did not unfold the problem systematically. Uh, what we learn is good, helpful, and may be a key to further research but they did not give us all the answers, nor did they fit the pattern together into a complete and orderly sequence. Thus we have traces of system. We have bridges between the Greek, the Chaldean, and the Indic, the Egyptian, and the Persian, but these bridges are not always clear, and there are many breaks 
in one case in one of the religions and in another case in another of the religions so that we are not able to fit these together to form the grand and simple pattern that we would like to be able to unfold in a good classroom manner. Uh, the information is simply lacking and to attempt to overlook this lacking would merely to be in, to invent, which I do not think we are justified in doing. We are going to try merely to explain as far as we can that which is known. We have every reason to recognize that the Greeks, in their philosophical era, were beginning to use what came later in medieval thinking uh, to be called the macrocosm-microcosm theory. In other words, they had begun to sense that the universe was the great being and man was the little universe. They had begun to create parallels between the unfolding life of the universe and the unfolding nature of man. They had further come to the conclusion that the structure of man was a miniature of the greater world and that the universal principles existing in space had a peculiar and natural existence in man. Therefore that man could be a clue to the universal mystery even as the universal mystery in its total uh, comprehension must be the total answer to the mystery of man. Thus the macrocosm-microcosm concept led definitely to the motion of mythology toward psychology, toward the recognition that the deities existed as principles, energies, powers, and forces operating within the consciousness of man himself. They have given us uh, considerable material in this direction, but again the patterns are not unbroken. And in an effort to put together what we can of these patterns, we must attempt in a way to restore uh, the old concept of the universe. Uh, the universe as it was recognized not only by ancient man in the European and Near East of theaters, but for that uh, purpose the total life of the ancient races. Well, this grand pattern permeates all of them descending to its last great exponent in our thinking, and that was Paracelsus of Hohenheim, who attempted to restore this entire theory and to use it as the basis of therapy. He again, however, wrote in such abominable low German that most of his ideas are obscure to us. And uh, so tedious is the problem of reading him that only the most heroic thinker will attempt to mine this source of information at the present time. <coughs> All these uh, are detriments, but even in spite of the detriments, we have certain rather obvious uh, strong points upon which we can uh, build. Uh, we have mentioned that the primary deities of the Greeks uh, consisted of a duality of powers, of which Uranus, or heaven, and Gaia, or earth, were perhaps the most primary. Uranus, or heaven, represents pure life, pure existence, uh, the absolutely unconditioned state of energy. The earth, or the great mother, represents the utter and complete polarity of matter. Now the Greeks were aware that both Spirit and matter were the offspring of eternity. That they were enclosed within or held in a complete abstraction even more remote from our understanding than the primary division. That this complete abstraction was also the common ground in which spirit and, spirit and matter had an identity. Thus the Greeks were aware of the fact that spirit and matter are not separate principles. They are merely the polarizations of an absolute or unconditioned essence. Thus pure life and pure matter are themselves uh, polarities of each other, with matter as the least degree of manifested life and uh, life 
as the supreme condition of the material state. These drift or move slowly, uh, like the harmonic intervals of a musical string, such as the monochord. And each of these conditions is finally a part or a degree or a state of absolute existence. Naturally, as with other peoples, efforts to define the nature of this absolute were, were considered more or less fruitless. Socrates, Pythagoras, Buddha, Confucius, and Plato agreed primarily in the principle that to define the infinite is to defile the infinite. These things are simply beyond comprehension. But out of the utterly incomprehensible, there emerges not only these conceivable or hypothetical polarities upon which all existence rests, but by their polarization an interval is created, an interval uh, between the above and the below, an interval between extremes. And in this common ground, or in this, uh, what the Nordic peoples call the Nunga Gap, or the cleft in space, uh, creation as we know it comes into existence. And out of the absolute operations of spirit and matter, or complete life and complete material substance, as these were understood, there arose a product which was the result of the operation of one on the other. And this product was time. Time was therefore the most ancient child of heaven and earth. And the experience of time has to do with duration. And as the Greeks express it, time is the measure of separateness. In other words, only when reality is in some way reduced from its own nature into a semi-illusionary state, or relativity takes the place of absolutivity. Only under such conditions can time come into existence. For time is a kind of a measure of the separateness of something from allness. While it remains within allness, it is not subject to time. But when it is separate from all this, it is subject to coming into existence. It is subject to continuing in existence. And it is subject to dissolution or departure from existence. And time is the measure of the coming, the continuing, and the departing of all things. Time, therefore, is merely man's way or man and nature's means of distinguishing the difference between the finite and the infinite. That which is infinite is timeless. That which is, is finite has a, an impermanent relationship to the infinite. And that impermanent relationship is time. And this time factor is that devouring thing which in turn dissolves and absorbs everything over which it is placed as ruler or governor. So between these two abstractions arises the dim, mysterious form of Cronus, the deity holding in one hand the sickle, the one that cuts all things down. This comes back to us in our medieval thinking as Father Time with his scythe, who cuts down all creatures. He is the reaper, the gatherer-upper of things. And in the ancient symbols, he carries not only the scythe in his hand, but wears a crown composed of an hourglass. This is uh, very interesting. And in one group of symbols, he is represented as combing out the tresses of a beautiful maiden, as though gradually uh, combing out or separating or removing the snarls or the knots or the cords or the twists or the turnings and confusions of everything because in the end time alone combs out all confusion 
and becomes the absolute critic, the final censor, the absolute judge of everything that exists. For that which is the noblest, as the Greeks pointed out, has the greatest endurance in time. The truly great person is longest remembered. The great truth is longest honored. And that which is less is more quickly forgotten or lost in the reaping of time. Thus many powerful and splendid things vanish in time because of their deficiency in reality. Whereas those things most like reality or possessing the greatest participation in reality have the greatest endurance in time. Time, though it must reap everything, protects some things longer than others and operates more slowly on those things over which it has less authority because they have more of timelessness or reality in themselves. So we have this ancient background but it is a very highly theoretical background. It is almost as though Uranus and Gaia and Cronus represent a living stage. They are like a vast theater of living energies upon which the drama will be unfolded. You do not see them anymore in the play because they are both the stage and the whole of the play. We no longer see them as persons, but they in some way mysteriously divide the play. For because of them, the play has its beginning, its middle, and its end. Because of them, the play has its chronology, its sequences, and it portrays those things which belong under the powers of heaven, earth, and time. Thus we see the effect of these elements constituting the legitimate factors of drama as represented in the plays of Sophocles and uh, the other great Greek playwrights. So the playwrights wrote only because time created drama. And without the time quality intervals there would be no drama. Your great cavalcade play showing the life of a person is the unfolding of time in that person. Or if a series of abrupt events make a complete play to be written as though the, the acting was within a few hours, this in turn is another kind of time pattern that determines the plot and is present forever, although not noticeable. Creation, therefore, is played upon the theater of time, upon the stage of this strange drama. The scenery, all of the mysterious parts of the amphitheater into which the audience gather to behold the play. This vast auditorium or coliseum or whatever it may be is actually the interval or the great space between spirit and matter in which the drama of time ceaselessly and inevitably unfolds. So the Greeks, having set their great stage, then produce their cast of characters, characters who are going to play out the drama, who are going to become the personifications of heaven, earth, and time. Everything must be so triangulated, and without this triangulation there can be no drama. For every drama, they say, is a triangle of some kind, we have one we know very well in modern drama called the Hollywood Triangle, which has probably supplied the incentive for 90% of our motion pictures. It is rather simple, homely, and destructive, but we make constant use of it. Now, uh, we then see also another division. All of this great background is made up of things that as such we cannot touch or feel or know. Uh, they therefore belong together to a kind of an imponderable. Uh, they are too remote, too mysterious for us even to picture them adequately. We cannot make diagrams of them successfully. They more or less lurk together on the blank paper upon which other pictures will be drawn. 
They become dimensions, laws and rules, never seen of themselves, but never absent from any compound that exists. Out of this then arises, as we have said, uh, the being who, to the Greek mind, became the focal point or the manifestation of things unmanifested. And this being was Zeus. Zeus being the surviving child of time. In other words, the, time, the child that time could not and did not dissolve. And this brings us to the nature of, of Zeus per se. Now in this struggle between absolute life, absolute extent of matter, and the rule or the law moving among them, time, there was produced something which was the product now, not of heaven and earth alone, but of heaven, earth, and time together operating. Now, if we have spirit, and we have matter, and we have time, and now we call this cause, effect, and we place between cause and effect another term meaning time, and this is opportunity. So we have cause, effect and the opportunity or condition of experiencing them. We have spirit and matter and we have experience. We have the mysterious power of time that becomes, so to say, the womb of the emergence of something. And this thing that emerges is according to the uh, Greek concept, an overbeing, a tremendous but not completely intangible creature. This creature, therefore, to them signified what to the Hindus we call the principle of para-atman. This being was a first, a beginning of things. It had certain attributes, and these attributes we uh, like to think of sometimes in our concept of consciousness. Buddha said that there is no such a thing as consciousness except that which react, results from the reaction of cause and effect. Cause and effect produces consciousness. Therefore, eternal cause and eternal effect, spirit and matter, through duration, or the unfolding of things in an orderly sequence, produces or produce together what we call consciousness. Now this is root consciousness. This is not the kind of consciousness that says, I know, nor is it the kind of consciousness that says, I think, or I believe, or I observe. Because assuming that this consciousness arose in the mystery of space and matter. We know that space is invisible. Pure matter is invisible. Time is invisible. So none of this condition arose from the contemplation of externals. It arose from the interior experience of certain flashing awareness or the discovery and the development of what the Greeks call the ox-eyed God, the mysterious God whose seeing is of an internal nature, like the ancient concept of Amitabha in Tibet, the contemplating Dhyana Buddha, that internalizes to know and externalizes to lose knowledge. This is a peculiar concept, but it is common to most people. So Zeus blazes forth as being the intuitive uh, factor of the realization of the action of life and matter through time. 
the Zeus becomes, in a sense, the wisest of all gods because he possesses the law of wisdom and endures in time. On the other hand, Zeus is strangely detached from all things that may be regarded as knowledge by man. Zeus represents, therefore, the flash of total awareness apart from the process of knowing. In the Tibetan and the Hindu, we discover that thought is created before mind. Now this would be a, a, would be a, a bit of a stopper, as they used to say in England, but it is nevertheless true. And Zeus is the eternal thinker, thinking the non-eternal thought which is existence. Zeus, therefore, is the thinker who produces within itself a strange and mysterious power. Perhaps we would be better almost to say that Zeus is thought as yet unembodied in a thinker. The thought by means of which in its infinite ramification a mind becomes necessary, but which in its own nature we do not recognize as necessary. Thus we have in Zeus a very a very strange basic value. And in the study or analogy between the Greek system of the universe and their microcosmic system or the relationship to man, Zeus represented the total auric or magnetic field of man. He was this sphere of energy from which the body of man is derived and which is the true abode of man who dwells not in the body but in the field of energy behind the body. <coughs> Zeus, therefore, is an interesting deity and we begin to understand now some of the things that he does. Most of the Greek gods are biformal. That is, they have two aspects or two appearances by which we know them. Zeus is not. Zeus, however, has another attribute. He is polyphonal. Instead of taking on, for instance, another god of the Greeks that we can mention would be uh, Hermes or Mercury. We know Hermes among the Greek arts mostly as a young man with winged heels and a winged hat carrying a caduceus or staff and springing off into space, apparently, in the best architect of architecture, such sculptures, sculptors as Cellini. But this is not actually the only form. The old Greeks made the statue as that of a venerable old bearded man, robed in a heavy toga and leaning upon a staff, sometimes bound with a serpent and sometimes not. Thus there was what was called the old or aged Hermes and the young one. And the same is true of Dionysus, who is represented as an old bearded man or as a very effeminate youth with a garland of vine leaves in his hair. There were two distinct forms of each of these deities. In Zeus there is not. But Zeus has this other peculiarity of forever taking on other shapes. He takes on the form of the swarm, in the uh, story of Leda. He takes on the form of the bull and abducts Europa. He is constantly taking on forms, but none of these forms are his own. And when whatever the escapade is that he is at present engaged upon, he returns to his own shape. Now, most of your deities in ancient times had this power to change their forms at will. The moment you represent or recognize Zeus as thought or as a being, a principle, we then become aware that this principle is moving constantly through an infinite pageantry of forms and appearances. Therefore, that it, that it should appear in countless forms is not unreasonable. 
especially if, as in the Greek mythology, all of the forms of Zeus are veiled references to the zodiacal forms, as in the Europa, which is the bull Taurus. This uh, different type of changing appearances merely represents the power of this universal agent or principle which in the course of existence takes upon itself all forms. In some of the oriental legends uh, we are told that the supreme being always took upon itself male and female aspects in the generation of any kind of creation. Thus the great deity Brahma becoming the male and female uh, uh, creature as in the case of, for instance of the horse and the mare took upon himself these forms and generated these creatures that then endured forever. But this one life has to take upon itself the positive and negative aspect of every type of creature that it is going to generate. Otherwise it cannot generate them. And this is one of the principles that lies behind the Greek mythology which makes it much more interesting when you begin to study the principles involved. The Greeks also recognize that in their order of gods they had something that must correspond to the various segments of human consciousness. And the Greeks had an order of worlds. These worlds were in every case related to their mystery dramas and to their ancient concepts of astronomy and to the elements which they recognized and in which they followed very closely most other peoples who represented or recognized four elements and a fifth essence or principle called in alchemy the quintessence or the fifth power from the very word quintessence which means fifth essence. In the Greek system then we start with a descent of gods. And the, these gods descending become embodied in terms which are not so different from those of some of the Asiatic philosophies and we'll try to work out something with them. The first of all is the celestial world. Now by the celestial world it is meant primarily uh, the world of the celestial bodies known as the Empyrean or the highest abode the abode of the luminous beings or star gods uh, that lie at the root of things uh, this world was ruled over by Apollo who was more or less the custodian and who rode his chariot through this diffusion as the lord of the sun. But the very world star spangled and planet embroidered through which he moved was itself the vestment or the flowing robe of the great hierophant. And uh, when ever the initiate as Apuleius tells us uh, in the mysteries of Persephone uh, passed into the chamber of initiation he was invested in a garment uh, which seemed to be of one piece and very full which was slipped over his head and hung down around him on all sides and on this garment were placed the representations of all of the heavenly and sidereal bodies so that he was heaven vestured when he went in to the great mysteries this the celestial region is the atmic plane of Asia, of Asiatic thinking. And this plane is substantially and essentially uh, the manifestation of Zeus. But it is placed under the control and direction of one of the sons of Zeus. For this son, Helios, or Light, then emerges from the dark mystery to bear witness to the hidden father who is robed in the vestments of the great mystery which is star-spangled space.
these elements we have to realize. Now in this mystery in which as yet Zeus has not moved into objectivity, we find two orders of deities developing. As we mentioned, one derived from the ancient titanic orders, the old gods, and the others arising from the progeny of ch or children of Zeus himself. And ultimately, as in most other mythologies, the old gods retire, disappear, and cease to be present. And the children of Zeus, or the products of this order of creation, take over and become the custodians of the various planes involved. The next world below the so-called celestial is called the spiritual. Now there is a difference between the spiritual and the celestial. Uh, the celestial has to do with dimensions uh, that are beyond. The spiritual life of man, for example, may be expressed through conduct here in this world. An individual may be a spiritual person without being a celestial being. He may have virtues and values. He may be heaven-like in some parts of his nature, but not so totally so that he can immediately retire into a heavenly condition. Spiritual, therefore, to the Greeks, had a little different quality of meaning from what we understand. To them it would be more, we will say, inspirational, intuitional. It was a region or uh, area of insight by an over faculty or an internal apperception of reality. And this would correspond to the Indian concept of buddhi. And we will gradually come into the great triad of Indian philosophy, Atma, Buddhi, and Manas. Atma being to a degree then the celestial, Buddhi the spiritual, Manas the mental. Now these conditions differ. Buddha is said, Gautama Buddha is said to have experienced identity with Buddhi, or with the principle of pure intuitive or illuminated uh, intuition or identification with the power to apperceive reality. This is supposedly also the idea of the samadhi, which is a spiritual state, but it exists within a celestial universe superior to itself. Now in the Greek mythology, we might be surprised to try to figure out to whom this would be associated in our quick uh, a list of the deities and we probably would not hit the correct one. But this association was made with Hera, the wife of Zeus, known to the Romans as Juno. Now in the actual story of the Greek mythology, Hera shares with Zeus in the rulership of the world. <coughs> Hera is referred to as the goddess governing and protecting uh, the moral life of the world. She is the one with whom Zeus is continually having difficulties whenever he performs any action by means of which he projects a formal creation into existence. His infidelity to her causes constantly her retaliation and it is the retaliation of the buddhic uh, intuition against the motions and processes of universal mind that constitutes quite an involved drama on this stage of affairs. We are reminded of the words of Paul that he tells us, when he would do good, evil is ever nigh unto him. The conflict between man's intuitive sense of realities and the eternal demands upon him by the processes of creation are represented by the struggle between uh, Zeus and Hera, or Jupiter and Juno. And yet she is the queen of heaven, 
She is the ruler of the spiritual region because she represents pure buddhic intuition. She represents this same factor that has been associated with the female since the beginning of time, the immediate apperception of value without intellection. And therefore she must always, as the buddhic principle, be the one who knows without knowing how she knows, or the one who knows without reason, arriving instantly at conclusions to which reason may attain only after the most circuitous efforts. And this peculiar internal inspirational intuition is therefore keyed to this spiritual region over which Hera has dominion. And we will later see how this drama works out. But we have to sort of get the members of the cast uh, identified. Now the third of these principles is the mental or intellectual sphere the Indian monastic world, divided into an old and a new, a high and a low, and therefore under the control of the deity that has no nature of its own, but takes on whatever nature that comes to it because of employment. In other words, we are speaking now of Hermes. Hermes representing the messenger or the communicator of the divine power. Hermes serves all the gods and becomes identified immediately with the one he serves. Having completed the service, he is no longer so identified. He brings no message of his own. He is only the communicator. And he is represented by the old bearded man and the young man with the wings on his feet. And the higher mind, uh, the Arupa Manas, is represented by the old bearded man. And the lower mind, or the embodied Manas, is represented by the young man. Therefore there are two minds in man, the abstract or reasoning mind, and the concrete or thinking mind. And thought and reason are not the same. But they are both interpreters, messengers. And like these messengers, they have several attributes. For Mercury, Hermes, is not only the one who becomes the guide, the, uh, the Virgil to every Dante seeking to pass through the mysteries of the under region. But also, uh, this deity is the god of thieves, of those who steal, of lying, of misrepresentation, and he is represented in his younger form nearly always as carrying with his caduceus a purse. He is the god of accumulation, and one of the main negative functions of the lower mind is accumulation. In other words, the use of intellect to increase worldly goods or possessions. Whereas the old Hermes with the beard and leaning upon his ancient staff is like Gurnemons, the aged guardian of the Grail Castle, or Merlin, the wise man. This is the mind that has gone beyond and therefore has chosen the philosophic contemplation of reality. So the twofold phases of mind. Now, the next or the fourth world corresponds very definitely with the Indian concept of kama or desire. This is the world in which emotion as yet not subordinated by reason or emotion of its own nature and kind thereby existing in its own world according to its own laws. And in these worlds and in these laws, correct, but becoming involved in the larger composite pattern of all the worlds operating together presents a rather complicated situation. And this world is the, therefore the world of desire, the world of illusion, 
the world of the bundle of attributes, uh, the world of the stacks, as Buddha calls them, are of faculty, actions, and reactions, and their effects upon man. In, in other words, this is the world of emotion, of possession, in the sense of emotion, possession, of hate, of fear, of worry, of doubt, and of all things which are by their natures intense. And in this region we find enthroned ancient Hades, keeper of the Plutonian realm. He therefore signifies uh, primarily uh, the keeper of the ghosts of illusion, or as the medieval mystics and magicians called it, the sphere of the astral light. This is the garden of Klingsor in Parsifal, the garden that is brought into existence by enchantment, or the strange magic garden referred to by the French transcendentalist Eliphas Levy in his work on transcendental magic, in which he says it is a beautiful garden filled with wonderful flowers, each one with a deadly serpent twisted around its stem. This is the world of Mara, of Buddhism, the world of the excess and the desire from which man must escape. Therefore, in the underworld of the Greeks, ghosts, shadows, are forever performing unnecessary and impossible tasks, having no real subsistence, and becoming the victims constantly of those excesses which they practiced on earth as referred to or paralleled in the story of Dante's Inferno. These, of course, are the illusions, the ghosts, the shadows, by which most men live, causing Plato to say that men go to this abode not when they die, but when they are born. It is life controlled by illusion. And over this illusion sits a grave and ancient Hades, who is the keeper of this, and whose three-headed dog forever guards the gates of this infernal region. The ancient Greeks, however, did not regard this region primarily as one of punishment. They regarded it as one of hopelessness, a going on forever. Perhaps they had, they, perhaps some of them were psychologists and had clients. If they had, they would know what this hopelessness means. But you can work with an individual to help him get over a bad streak of selfishness for ten years to find in the end that he is just as selfish about the next thing he wants. Nothing seems to change because it is not here that the change can be affected. Now this leaves us one more deity and one more sphere to accomplish. And that is body, which is the next lowest in this cycle of the ladder of worlds. Well, this ladder, as you can sense already, is very largely a psychological ladder, a ladder of factors. Now, the material world was to the ancients not a principle or an abode of principles, but a reservoir or receiver into itself of the principles of other things. Therefore, there is no karma or debt related to earth. All debt is paid in relationship to some other cause, and the drama is simply played out here. Thus, uh, body is no cause of evil in itself. Man is not ever punished for being embodied. That is sufficient retribution in itself. Man is punished merely through the body, symbolically for the things which he does to the body, and by doing them through his own body to the body's lives and natures of others around him. It is always the person in the body who is the carrier of responsibility, never the body itself. Therefore, strangely enough, the Greeks had a very beautiful thought about the body. They said that it belongs to matter, and that wonderful and strange as it may seem, Matter which to us seems to be so rather disagreeable a thought, standing for materialism and all that thing, 
actually matter is forever pure. Matter of itself can never be defiled. There is nothing cleaner than a good clean handful of good clean dirt. Matter in itself is never evil. It is never actually polluted by what anyone can do to it. Anything living in a material state pollutes only itself when it attempts to pollute matter. Matter is never polluted. Therefore, to the Greeks, matter was the world virgin, an eternal principle that is forever the victim of others, and yet, regardless, is never defiled. Because matter is, is wonderfully enough never soiled, but things living in it soil themselves and each other through their conduct. But when they depart and that body goes back to the earth again, it is pure again. It is the impurity of the person and not the body. For nature purifies everything, and in nature nothing that is corrupt is left. It must always be purified again. And so it's not unreasonable that to this sphere they should assign their deity Hestia, whom we call Vesta. Vesta itself, in suggesting not only uh, purity, but also vestment, the body. And the body, therefore, is the eternal virgin, because of itself it never defiles itself, because it is not a principle. It can never do evil, because it can never do anything. It is always the result of other things operating upon it, that causing, causing it to have innumerable appearances. Therefore, modestly draped in the ancient costume of the time, with the fold of her robe over her head, Vesta remains forever the verdant earth, beautiful, pure, beyond defilement. And those who would defile it, defile themselves. This is uh, a very interesting philosophical point if we want to study it. So here we have what we might term not only persons of a drama, but we have, like Faust, a play in five acts. Each of these acts taking place on one of these levels, under the sphere and body of one of these deities, whose very natures become the pr principles, energies, and worlds associated with them. Therefore, the material plane is Vesta. And within this material plane, man's material body becomes his vestment, or his uh, garment, the robe which he throws over his shoulder and around his head, concealing always part of his own face, which is interesting because, as we know, the mask of the persona always hides part of itself. In this uh, little drama, then, we have a, a wonderful set of stage settings. And in this set of stage settings, things begin to happen. And when these things begin to happen, we have a series of myths created in which all of these elements suddenly become uh, not only embodied, uh, but become strangely exaggerated, almost caricatures of their own temperaments. So out of these principles come persons with limitations of one kind or another, with restrictions upon themselves, with certain powers and certain weaknesses, with vision and insight in some matters and none in others. And we think of these as being merely drawn upon the mind of man by some ingenious artist of long ago. This is not essentially true. We are dealing with symbols which were used to conceal ideas of the deepest and most enduring importance. So we now go back to Zeus again, because we've, we've set him up here uh, behind the scenes, so to say, and given him a wonderful stage on which to operate. But we don't see very much operation as yet. We only see the worlds through which he is going to move and work. The certain deities with whom he is going to be related. And we must then come back and study Zeus himself. 
Now, uh, Zeus is hard to study because there is probably no deity in the Greek mythology who has more names, uh, more uh, various titles, and uh, a wider diffusion of actions on an innumerable group of planes than this so-called father of the gods and men. He is presented usually as a grave and massive person, bearing in his hands the thunderbolts which are the peculiar symbols of his authority. He is therefore the thunderer. Anciently he was the sky, and the thoughts that moved through his mind were the clouds. Whenever he rattled his thunderbolts, the earth shook. And his grave appearance reminds us also uh, that in spite of his vast years and incalculable age, he is declared definitely never to have grayed, but to have had the blackest of hair and beard. This black hair and beard, of course, to the ancients was associated with the dark clouds of storm. And uh, he hid himself also, of course, upon the great mountain of Olympus, where he remained in his own nature. But he did not stay there always. He came down the mountain into the various activities and associations with which his career has been identified. Now, we know that the mountain of Zeus is simply another name. Olympus is another name for the world's sacred mountains, wherever we may cross them or find them referred to. This mountain, of course, is the Kalasa of India or the Simuru. This mountain, it rises above the earth. And, of course, this mountain is in itself a symbol of a region beyond creation. all-powerful, because even as we proceed in the study of Zen or any of the uh, Othman Sufi mysticisms, this peculiar suspension of knowing in the total state of itself is invincible. It is the parent of all powers. It is the only thing which in a strange way may produce many things, but never be in itself shaken or moved. Thus Zeus has a strange relationship uh, to the absolute autocracy of the thing as it is. No matter what you want to do about anything, whatever it is, it is. Whatever you want to do about universal law, about the gods, about men, about creation, about science, art, or literature, you must finally come to the point where you shrug your shoulders and say, that which is, is. There's nothing more we can do about it. So this isness of it is the strange power which makes Zeus the supreme autocrat. Zeus, through a series of generations of many kinds, feels this strange group of worlds which we have described under the rulership of these five levels of divine attributes. Some of these worlds, incidentally, belong to the titanic preceding cycles of existence. Others emerge as children of Zeus himself. Later we will try to differentiate those more clearly, but at the moment it would interfere with our general thinking. Instead of that, therefore, we will say here is the state of interior true fact. The thing as it is. Nature according to being, instead of according to seeming or appearing to be. And, be. and the clouds moving over the face of the great Olympian height divide the universe into being and appearing. Everything above those clouds is being. Everything below those clouds is seeming or appearing to be. 
for all fact lies above the clouds, and all principles reside there, and it is their extension into a state of non-reality which gives them tangibility to us. Therefore, we perceive according to the error of things rather than according to the fact of things. And our way of knowing is by discovering that this and that and something else, they are not true. We discover that which is, not by directly finding it, but by discovering that which it is not, or that which is not. And in all definition of principles, we must approach by virtue of the language itself, always in the negative. The moment we say what a thing is, we make it less. The only thing we can do is to try to discover that which is not itself. And that which remains is whatever itself may be. Now this brings us to another pretty little part of our drama. For out of the nature of being, born out of the striving of spirit and matter, and made fructified or fruitful by time, emerges this fact, the fact of being, that which exists forever in the state of being identical with being and of a conscious at one moment with being without thought. Now this remains static, however, and that is one of the difficulties that has been pointed out in connection with Eastern philosophy, that if you get into this state you do nothing, and that is considered to be bad. Of course, this is a question, because when you get out of this state, you do all kinds of things, but they're not important, so you can decide for yourself. Now, of all the progeny of Zeus, of all the creatures fashioned out of the state of being, all except one is the result of a polarization. It is a result of the state of being entering into conspiracy with one of these planes that we have expressed. Zeus as being, taking upon itself or himself one of his attributes or forms, goes forth into some realm or sphere, uh, perhaps uh, goes as he does on one occasion into the land of Cadmus, and there he woos Semele, the daughter of Cadmus, and from this union is born Dionysius Zagras, the savior. But, uh, but Zeus came forth into this world, here into that sphere. He went to Cadmus in one of the mildest of his forms, it is said. He went only as a spirit. He, he came unembodied, as in the ancient legend, uh, Cupid first came to Psyche. Eros appearing first as only a voice, but never seen. And it was only when Hera, whose peculiar attributes of intuition had been violated by this union, takes upon herself the form of the old woman and forces upon Semele doubt as to the nature of the mysterious spirit that overshadows her that Semele then exacts from Zeus the fulfillment of a promise that he will do anything that she asks. He then takes the oath, the great oath of Zeus, taken by the river Styx. The great oath, therefore, that is taken in the land that divides the mind from desire and promises that he will grant her wish. Semele, then very much like Psyche in the parallel myth, then demands that Zeus shall appear to him, to her, in his true form, in his full and true splendors, and thereby remove any doubt as to his real identity. Here you find the very same principle that Bailey tells us about in the idea of the mercy and the wrath of God that as long as man has faith, he knows only mercy. But when he doubts, mercy changes into wrath. As faith, he sees only the beauty of God. As fear, 
or as negative emotion, he opens himself to the law of God, which appears as the great wrath or the lawfulness in which the principle of mercy is completely invisible, though it is ever present. Zeus tries every way possible to convince Semele that she should not exact this demand. But she insists, and it is said then that the great God took upon himself the slightest of the panoply of his powers, as little of his grandeur as possible, but and appeared to her as a magnificent power or blazing being. And of course the very light of his presence utterly consumed her. It was then, of course, that he also rescued his son who was born at that moment from the burned and charred ashes of the child's mother and carried the child back with him to Olympus to where it was to become later the savior god of the Greeks. But it was therefore uh, again Zeus moving out of his own nature uh, first as subtly as possible and then in the presence of doubt or of fear or perhaps the idea of prove it which we so often use prove exteriorly that which is an internal mystery and uh, uh, the words spoken at the time of the crucifixion of Christ if you be the son of God come down from the cross save yourself and in this peculiar situation in psychology uh, we have uh, one of the elements that is quite interesting in the Greek myths because Zeus is a very intriguing situation to, compo to cope with in the sphere of mythology remember this divinity was symbolically delineated by a very highly psychological and philosophical people much more so perhaps than most of the other races with which we are familiar at that period in culture development but to come back to Zeus now he exists in this form and through his mixing with the beings on all planes we find that he brings forth various progeny but this various progeny nearly always has a strange and tempestuous career because they become instruments of evolutionary procedures in all of these spheres of existence. But Zeus, in order to escape all involvement and to produce a power suitable for his own needs, creates or generates out of his own mind what the ancients in India might have called the mind-born God. In this case, the mind-born god is a goddess. And in this case, the goddess is Pallas Athena, born of the god by an immaculate conception within his own being. We have, therefore, knowing, truth, the nature of being, producing out of itself its handmaiden, whom, like the Brunhilde of the Odinic rites, becomes the alter ego of her own father. This being Minerva or Pallas Athena, born full grown, helmed and speared, and carrying upon her arm her father's shield, the shield of the great sky god. This particular power, therefore, is appropriate and naturally associated with the highest and most abstract form of knowledge which is wisdom wisdom is the immaculately conceived offspring of truth wisdom is born unpolarized and this is very important inasmuch as it represents a complete synthesis of all reasoning powers there is ignorance and there are very many aspects of knowledge and lack of knowledge. But wisdom as personified by Athena, the Greek concept of wisdom, is unpolarized. Ignorance to them is not the opposite of wisdom. Ignorance is the opposite of knowledge. 
There can be no opposite to wisdom. Because wisdom represents a divine thing in its own nature. It is not worldly wisdom. It is not wisdom arising from the, the labor of man. It is wisdom bestowed by God. Therefore, it is the highest form of the wisdom principle. Minerva of Pallas Athena actually, consequently, becomes associated with a great number of attributes. First of all, she is a virgin, being the only deity of importance in the pantheon from whom no progeny descend. Uh, she is never involved in any a relationship other than to serve her father. And in him she is complete and in her he finds his own complement. He is the only being in whom he confides. And she is his right arm in all the things that he does. It is consequently this thought that Zeus, through wisdom, who becomes his handmaiden or his, or his agent, his primary agent in procedure, brings forth all things according to their orders. She becomes uh, the mind maiden who does whatever his will directs. In our various attributes, Athena then represents two kinds of wisdom. She is, first of all, a goddess of war. And secondly, she is a goddess of peace. As a goddess of war, we have her involved in the same concept as we find in the Bhagavad Gita, where Arjuna and Krishna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra try to analyze the meaning of war. The war over which Athena uh, functions is the mysterious war of existence. And in this war, she always fights in the heavens for the victory of the right. Therefore, her battlefield is the world of the experience of created things. Therefore, she is wisdom ensuring the ultimate victory of right over wrong. After the victory has been achieved, theoretically at least, although we do not have too much uh, evidence of this victory in our daily experience, Athena then becomes the patroness of peace. And as the patroness of peace, she is also the patroness of a certain peculiar art, which is important in philosophy. She is the patroness of weaving. She is the one who weaves the threads and puts together the patterns. For weaving was to the Greek mind a very apt simile for such things as the wisdom of Plato or Pythagoras, the weaving together of knowledge to form the great tapestry of living truth. Therefore she supplies the threads of life and time, experience, effort, hope, fear, and from all these things are woven together the mysterious tapestry. And this occurs to us again because <coughs> Athena was the one who brought to the wife of Ulysses, Penelope, the strategy of weaving the tapestry which she continued to weave and which uh, she used as an excuse for not accepting the suitors who sought to gain her favors while her husband was away. It is, it is a very, there's a very clever and interesting involvement there that Penelope will not stop weaving until the tapestry is done and every night she unravels what she has woven the day before so that the tapestry is never finished. These, uh, this strategy was given to her by Athena as a means of protecting her virtue while the hero Odysseus was passing through the great initiations of Poseidon as set forth in the Odyssey and the Iliad. 
Now, Athena also was called the tamer of horses because to the ancients she and she alone represented the power to bridle the winged horse Pegasus. She alone could ride him. She alone could place the bridle of control upon him. And she also was able to break the steeds of Bellathon, another tremendous uh, problem in Greek mythology. Uh, Athena, as the horse tamer, became the symbol of wisdom as the tamer of the will, the horse being the symbol of the will. And, of course, the enlightened or illumined will becomes the winged horse, the, what uh, the ancients called the horse of high verse, the uh, horse of the muses, who stamped with his hoof upon the earth of Parnassus and brought forth the streams of Halicon. All these legends have a wonderful meaning if we can fit them together. So when once wisdom, or Athena, had become the proper servant of Zeus, Zeus was liberated into the power to create or fashion worlds. And out of this fashioning of worlds, we have a microcosmic analogy when we come into uh, the study of man's own nature. We have within man what we might say in the Greek term, uh, the Noah, uh, the Greek idea of nous, uh, the principle that regardless of whatever happens to the body, whatever happens to, to the individual during life or death, the Noah, the archetypal being, the anthropos, remains unchanged, the over-self of Emerson. This knower, according to the Greeks, was Zeus. And this knower, reaching into manifestation in the psychological integration of man, brings forth as its servant, as its instrument, and as its living agent, the higher principle of wisdom. And this higher principle of wisdom is finally associated with and embodied into uh, the concept of buddhi. For the knower uh, becomes identical or identified with illumination, intuition, and these other high attributes of consciousness. The Pythagoras and Plato both point out that this buddhic principle which represents uh, man's spiritual internal power to approach the Noah uh, is equivalent to the consort of Zeus. Therefore, Zeus, abiding in his own peculiar realm, makes as his first adjustment with existence his union with the world buddhic principle or in the case of man, with the energy of spiritual knowing, which is resident and which forms the consort or shakti of Zeus. This spiritual knowing, however, as in the case of Jupiter and Juno, is static. Therefore, to overcome this and to bring the precipitation of existence into objectivity, Zeus produces this unpaired power, Athena. And this unpaired power becomes the means by which man is able uh, to achieve his own liberation and by means of which also the divine power is able to create. The divine power therefore moving through the attribute of absolute wisdom which is absolute conformity with absolute law, precipitates by means of Athena uh, the monastic principle, 
or the principle of mind. Athena is the, is the bridge between consciousness and mind. And by virtue of mind, or the mind polarity in man, man becomes aware of the gods above and aware of his humanity below. Mind, therefore, is in this middle distance uh, between all things. And mind is, uh, consequently, the hermetic principle. When then we say that Hermes was the author of 80,000 books, all we are doing is saying that the mind is the author of all books. That the mind is therefore the principle of ingenuity. That the great dialogues of Hermes to Tatian represent nothing more or less than the mind forever instructing the personality. But the mind itself is not enough, for behind the mind must stand this power of true wisdom, from which the mind is able to gather its positive inspiration and in turn receive into itself the powers of the divine purpose. In the Gnosis and in other systems, we therefore have a Sophia, who is, stands in middle distance between the superior powers of the Demiurgus. And it is Sophia who has the pure principle of wisdom that uh, achieves uh, the mysterious redemption. Minerva is Sophia. Minerva is also the strange maiden of the troubadours. The wisdom which is sung to as a beautiful, pure, virgin person. The true goal of all human regenerated desire. This being only the desire for truth. Minerva is not represented as emotional because of the importance of sublimating the karmic principle, which cannot be present in the true truth seeker. Yet she is not evidently lacking in the greatest of all emotions, and that is devotion. And devotion to truth, Buddha says, is the only permissible emotion. Consequently, we begin to see some of these attributes uh, falling into place. Now, out of this we come to another uh, cycle that is important. We've already mentioned to you that we have produced an ego or a selfness. We have tied it with a link or bridge, the golden bridge of hope. We have tied it to the monastic principle of mind. And we have set up a kind of creation. Now in the Greek mythology, creation consists of three processes, of which the first is a generation because in the Greek they did not believe that something came from nothing as the way we consider creation. Rather they considered creation as a generation from divine sources. That creation was an eternal condition moving from its own internal suspension into manifestation remaining in manifestation through four ages or eras which correspond to the Indian yukas and then returning again into its own nature by the retiring of all objective things thus an outflowing and an inflowing within a great cycle of time and in this cycle of time uh, there comes the age of iron and in the age of iron, we come upon the mysterious symbol. We find out why Vulcan, uh, Hespasius, is the deity of fire. Because fire alone works iron and the metals. He is therefore the Tubalcane, the builder, the one who casts uh, the instruments and who pounds swords into plowshares. He is also the one who creates the armament of the gods. 
Iron in the Greek mythology has a meaning that you have to think through twice, or you'll, you will uh, you will not get the real point of it. Because actually, we think of the age of iron as the least of the four yugas or the four ages. But actually, the word iron to the Greek meant mind. The age of iron is the age of the mind, and over this uh, uh, power is Vulcan, for the fire of human experience. The flames of human aspiration are used to temper iron, and the sword Excalibur of perfect steel that belonged uh, to Arthur the king, and the great sword of the of uh, the uh, paladins of Charlemagne. And all these swords represent iron gradually transformed by fire into steel. Take the sword of quick detachment and cut the snaky branches low, says the Gita, relating to the use of the sword to destroy illusion. The sword, therefore, is mind. Iron is mind. The age of iron is the age of mind. And Vulcan is the kind of worldly experience which transforms mind into the steel of true enlightened will power. In any event, we have this series of cycles. And here we've mentioned already the story of Dionysus, carrying this story from the time uh, of the appearance of the god Zeus as a voice to the point where obeying the, the secret instruction of Hera. Semele demands the appearance of Zeus in his full power and cosmic expression, and in this demand loses her life. Now we know that Zeus has taken the child and created a temporary womb for that child in his own body in order to save the life of the child. He then returns to his own abode and selecting, according to one account, Athena and according to the other account, Hermes, as his agent, has this child carried away to Nisa the Blessed, a land of mountains in the distant region of things. And the name of the region simply means in the abode of peace. And here, uh, this infant is placed into the keeping of Salinas, the aged one. Now, Salinas is a kind of being who is a sort of satyr. He is a uh, deity of strange and rather unprepossessing appearance, and in the Greek philosophy, it was accustomed in the time of the great Periclidean age for Socrates to be called Silenus because they had the same rather disproportioned appearance. And he was often called Silenus. And uh, it is quite probable that in the development of the personality of Socrates in the Platonic dialogue, an effort was made to perpetuate the mystery of Silenus and what he represented in the cosmic picture through the form of Socrates. Silenus was the nurse of Dionysus. His name, into a certain way, means meditation. He means internal life or internal expression. He means yoga. He takes the child, Bacchus, to his cave. And the cave in this place uh, represents an internal state of knowing. In a mountain, which is the symbol of the glory of truth. And I shall lift up mine eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. So the mountain is always the symbol of the divine abode. And here, surrounded by nature spirits, by satyrs and nymphs, by strange dryads and creatures that do not belong to this world, the young god was brought up. But Hera was not satisfied 
her vengeance was not complete. So the young Dionysus uh, was subjected to a terrible ordeal. With the assistance and conspiracy of the Titans, the primordial giants that had come down from ancient times and presumably still including Cronus, Rhea, and the other great titanic deities, a fell's plot was laid. A plot that is reminiscent of certain words in the opening chapters of Genesis where it is said that God, perceiving the danger that man should become like God, caused him to be cast from the garden. Because if he ate of the tree of life, he would be truly as the gods. And to prevent this, he was cast out of the garden. Now in this second situation, we have a similar conspiracy wrought in a different way. By means of a great mirror, the mirror now being the Kamic plane, the young godling Dionysus was lured away from his safe retreat among the blessed hills of Nisa, lured away from peace by the, pres by the presentation of a reflection in a mirror. Here is your Narcissus problem. And here is also the story of the Japanese sun goddess, Amiterasu Omikami. Because when she got into a pout and locked herself in a cave, the gods lost the sun and had no more light. And they could do nothing, but finally one of them hit upon a strategy. He get, told them to gather in front of the cave and talk loudly, saying that they had found a new sun goddess, more beautiful than the one who had locked herself in the cave. They then got a mirror of polished metal and held it in front of the cave. And the sun goddess, peeking out to see who this rival for her charms might be, saw an eye peeking back at her. She looked a little further, came out a little further, and saw her own radiant face. And having seen no such face before, was convinced that it was another person and dashed out of the cave to scratch the eyes out of her adversary. Whereupon the gods moved in behind and closed the cave behind her so she could never get back. From that time on, we had the sun reasonably and normally performing its duties. <laughs> but in the case of Dionysius, the little god, seeing the reflection, thought it was another child like himself. And because he had been raised only by these strange aged satyrs and Silenus, and had known no playmates of its own kind, it ran out with its toys to play with this other child. And as it approached, the titans drew back the mirror until the child followed its own reflections far into the most distant places of space. And when they had reached a very far and distant place, the titans turned upon the child and attempted to capture it. Some say Dionysus himself, others say the gods that protected him, then caused the child to turn into innumerable shapes, like uh, uh, Alberac trying to escape the um, charms of Loki in the grind gold. The little fellow changed from one shape to another, trying to deceive the titans as to his true appearance. But finally, when he took upon himself the form of the bull, they fell upon him and slew him. And when they so did, uh, they then to hide their crime and to leave no mark thereof, decided to eat the body. So they cooked it upon a fire. And as they were cooking it, the odor of the cooking ascended through all the realms of space until Odin, upon, uh, um, Zeus upon his throne, uh, smelled the strange odor. Looking down with his all-seeing eye, he beheld immediately the truth of this matter that his own son had been destroyed by the titans. Therefore he launched his thunderbolts against them, by means of which they were all incinerated. 
He then, by his magical means, uh, transformed his child again into its true likeness and brought the child back to Olympus. In the so doing, however, he entrusted the head of the child, Bacchus, to Athena as its peculiar and proper guardian. And having restored the child to life, it received then the name of the twice-born, or the one who had passed through death and had been restored again. Then, as the course of time went on, the gods in the choice of materials for the creation of humanity uh, chose to make man out of the ashes of the titans, and in so doing molded into every human body not only these ashes but the flesh of Bacchus which the titans had eaten. Therefore every body that exists, every living person, possesses a temporal and exterior nature, titanic, uncontrollable, mad, derived from the twelve primordial giants, and within that nature also the blood of the eternal God of salvation, Dionysius Zagros. This legend uh, is also interesting for another reason. Dionysus, in this legend, if you study the whole problem very carefully, becomes the symbol of the breaking up of the continuity of human consciousness through the mystery of rebirth. Uh, Dionysus, in this instance, represents, therefore, uh, the many aspects of the soul in its journey and the various forms into which Dionysius changes himself in the effort to escape destruction by the Titans is, if properly read, the complete story of the evolutionary growth of man through the kingdoms of nature up to his present spiritual estate. This is interesting furthermore because, of course, in this case, the Titans not only represent uh, the primordial powers, but they represent uh, the fact that the primary elements as represented by the titanic order of life is also diffused throughout the universe. And that whereas the titans as principles occupy in this principle the relation of heaven or Uranus, the titans are also parts of matter and become involved in the mystery of Gia or the material element, the negative pole. Thus the twelve orders of material things, the twelve substances of nature, recognized by the Greeks, become the titans that attempt to destroy or eat up the soul and succeed in doing so in the mystery of incarnation. Zeus, however, turns his thunderbolts against the process of crystallization, destroys the power of matter, rescues his son, and restores him to life with the cooperation and assistance of Athena. The study of the toys of Dionysius, particularly the bull rattle, which he carried, the story of the little god and all the things that happened to him are like the Narcissus legend, for Plato tells us that by Narcissus is to be understood man gazing into matter and seeing the reflection of himself in a material state, falling into this state and entering into, the, into a condition of spiritual obscuration, by means of which he falls under the power of the material powers of things and has the terrible disaster of being eaten up by the titans. Now, another name for the titans, of course, in your Greek mythology, there are twelve of them, and as you might suspect, they are the zodiac. Now, when uh, Pythagoras wrote on the subject, he said, men falling into birth or into embodiment 
fall through the bodies of the twelve holy animals. Now these twelve holy animals are the zodiac. Therefore, the story of the Titans represents also uh, the destiny of man in the creational sphere in which he is born through the bodies of animals, become, so to say, devoured by the subzodiacal universe, becoming captured and held in it, so that he becomes the victim of the forces and powers represented by the twelve titanic zodiacal signs, from which he is rescued, ultimately, by the mystery of Dionysus. And uh, Dionysus then comes gradually into its full focus as representative of the soul, or the life of man that is born out of the experience mechanism of material or sidereal existence. The head or the cause or proper nature of the soul is kept by Minerva as the principle of wisdom. Let us see a parallel of that because each story differs enough so that unless you have all the stories you cannot fit every part of it together. The last Orpheus, the Thracian bard, after the mysterious account of the loss of Eridiki, who descends unto the underworld, is rescued by Orpheus, but lost by him again because he does not obey the law of Kamaloka, where, Posa, where Hades is lord. He looks back before he has left the region, and for this is deprived forever of the symbol of this psychic part of his own nature. Orpheus, after this occasion, is possessed by a strange madness, and he wanders about the earth singing melancholy songs and playing the most dismal and heart-rending um, tunes upon his lute. He goes on and on and on, and the whole world weeps with him, and the misery of it all is more than the world apparently can bear. And as he comes at last into the uh, into Thessaly. He comes into the forest there, and the birds and the animals and the creatures of the forest all gather around him, as in the story of St. Francis. And they listen and join in the strange, sad, solemn sounds that come from the heartbroken poet and his instrument. And about this time, the an order of Bacantes that are called the Cyconian women who ran in frenzied mobs through the forest, worshipping their deity, with torchlights and cries and shouts, uh, are offended by the strange, sad melody which is so different from their own. But the deity is immortal, for nothing can injure him while the music is being played. So what they do is to raise such a terrible din with their instruments and their voices that they drown out the music. And in this way, the poet is no longer immune. They taught to fall upon him, kill him, tear his body to pieces, and cast the remains into the river. Here, the head and the lute or instrument float down the stream, and the same strange melodies are heard. And in this psychological moment, Athena, descending from her celestial abode at the order of Zeus, gathers up the lute and the head, and return them, returns with them to Olympus, where the head of the deity or of Orpheus continues to give oracles for ages. Later a shrine is created for him on earth, and his lute and his head are placed there as a testimony to mankind. Athena again picks up a head and takes it back to Olympus. The head of Orpheus is the symbol of his doctrine. The esoteric school, which gives oracles, or continues to teach, even after the body of the school has been broken up or torn apart by the chaos of ignorance, represented by the Cyconian Bacantes. In the case of Dionysius, the soul is returned again to the Father, and there it remains until it is set forth again as the young Dionysus. This was another appearance of it. We have Dionysus, we have Dionysus Zagros, 
and we have the Bacantian Dionysus. They are all different deities, or rather different aspects of the Messiah principle in Greek philosophy. Ultimately, Dionysus becomes the conqueror of the world and the restorer of, his, of the glory of the spiritual kingdom of his father. He therefore becomes the inheritor of the world, taking the place of Zeus. And Zeus, even while Dionysus is a child, hands him his thunderbolts, the supreme symbol of his power. And in the Greek, we are told that the little child, who shall indeed lead them, is the symbol of purity. And that the, the, the principle, therefore, of Dionysus is the principle of purity, the principle of regeneration, resulting in the guileless one who is represented as a child, in whose nature there is no evil. And that to this one, and to this one alone, Zeus can bestow his thunderbolts. And therefore he permits Dionysus to sit upon his throne, use and inherit his powers even while a child. And Dionysus returns to the legends of Christianity and Europe under the Galahad story and under the white knight and the guileless one, who for whom the siege perilous is forever waiting. That is the seat of the stranger, the seat of the one who is promised. Dionysus is the promised one, the only being in all the world to whom Di uh, Zeus will entrust the supreme symbol of his power, because he knows that in this one it will never be used to injure. All of these legends uh, take a great deal more description than we can put on them. But uh, we then come to another interesting type of point. We are now moving inevitably toward another cycle. The cycle of the ones who have to fight with the Titans. And of this cycle we have certain uh, heroes. For as surely as this divine order is moving downward from the celestial through the spiritual through the intellectual through the emotional and into the physical world so the earth is producing the harvest of the dragon's teeth for these teeth were sowed in the earth and they raised an army and the army turned upon itself to destroy itself which was of course a story of mortality and mankind but there was also being born by the union of gods and earth another group of creatures possessing certain attributes or powers. In this group we have such beings, such heroes as Odysseus or Ulysses. We have a more direct and magnificent example perhaps of the entire heroic concept in Hercules. We have the hero warrior in Achilles, we have the hero leader or organizer in Agamemnon. We have the hero sage in Nestor. We have a whole group of heroes. We have the heroic journey of the Argonaut. We have uh, the mysteries which have to do with the rescue of Andromeda and many other things in which the hero is forever coming into focus. The hero as Oedipus, facing the mystery of the Sphinx. Always the hero, and nearly always the hero as the dying god, or the tortured one, or the one bearing forever uh, the, the scars of the struggle against the mysteries of providence. Therefore, we have a new order now coming up from the earth, the orders of the heroic beings. These are the ones who are moving out from below upward. They are the ones in whom the blood of Bacchus, which was locked in the compound of the creation of man, is beginning to gain ascendancy over the ashes of the Titans. And because of this blood of Bacchus, being inevitably and properly within them, they have the power to reach and climb up 
the mountains that lead to the Olympian heights. Thus out of the earth come Prometheus and Apelles, come the great heroes who are going to be the saviors. Also the strange races that are generated there, like the centaurs under the leadership of wise old Chiron. All of these become parts of this story, which now turns abruptly and begins to move from below upward, in which man, having certain binding ties, being bound eternally to heaven by a power even greater than the gods, asserts his sonship. And also, as in the Sigurd saga, how Zeus, entering into a conspiracy with his fellow gods, seeks first to impede this progress, and later to advance it, to impede its premature statement, to prevent man from attaining heaven without labor, but moving around to produce a situation that forces man upward. And by this forcing, ultimately uh, brings or restores uh, the dead Dionysus to life. It is quite an interesting and complicated subject, so we'll have to work on that one a little bit next week.